Welcome back to Switched to Linux. Well, it is time for a refresh on our Cubes videos. We first did some in the last version of Cubes, which was somewhere in the three branch. And uh, since then, I have not had a chance to use Cubes, and it's been on my list to do for quite a while now. And I just have not had the opportunity. I'm like, you know what? I'm done with not having the opportunity we're just going to go ahead and do it we're going to split this over a few different weeks so before we get started if you're looking for an install guide it is not this week next week we're actually going to be looking at the installation today i want to talk about the philosophy behind cubes use case scenarios where i've used it in the past what you can do with it and things like that i didn't want to do that and then install and just have this big long video uh, because installing it itself is a little bit more complicated uh, setting up is a little bit more complicated you might have to toggle around on some settings to get some wireless cards working. Who knows? Maybe they fixed all that. That's what I used to have to do anyway. <laughs> um, but I have not used it since version 4, so it'll be a learning experience for all of us. But let's go ahead and uh, get on into our introduction to cubes. And I want to talk mostly here, and, and I want to start in with kind of talking about the reasons, the philosophies, and the use cases for running cubes. Now, Cubes, as we look at different Linux distributions, Cubes is, in my opinion, one of the most secure and one of the most private distributions. Let me correction. It is the most secure Linux distribution you can use on a, a basic daily driver, and it has the potential for being a horribly secure system. <laughs> I used the word horrible in there, but it is very good for, for privacy factors as well as security, but it doesn't have to be. You see, you isolate cubes into a variety of different setups where you can have, if you have a high risk scenario, you get an email, you're like, I really want to know what this scammer's up to. And I got one of those the other day. I'm like, I really want to click on this link, but I don't really want to click on this link. Well, in cubes, you can boot up what's called a disposable VM. It spins this thing up you can do whatever, and then once you close it, it disappears into the ether, and whatever happened there it will never be seen again. Uh, very fascinating. But you can also have your standard users, your standard accounts, in which case those ones will stay logged into your account. You can access your emails. Now, I've used cubes in the past in two separate scenarios. The first of those is I had a general cubes set up for testing purposes, which you can tie in one operating system I can have logged into all of my switch to Linux stuff and then another cube I can have logged into all of my Christian stuff for example so I can have one system and simultaneously be logged into each of the different elements separately of each other and uh, that was a really nice feature and then whatever happens in one VM is invisible to the other VM which adds a lot of the privacy elements to it and so you have the ability to spin things up. You actually have the ability to actually boot up. Um, you can boot up extra uh, Linux distros within it as well. I've done that in the past. Uh, speaking from the 3X branch, hopefully that is preserved here in the 4X. Now, the second use case I have used for cubes is there was a point in time when I actually was one of the lead developers for an organization that did websites for activist groups. And being as that we were activist groups, we had a higher target on our back. And so they came down and they're like, hey, uh, we need to have uh, we need to to have better security protocols. And of course, most of these guys are using like Windows. And I'm like, OK, the security protocols you're talking about are not very good. You want secure protocols? I'm using cubes and I converted every bit of my workflow to a cubes OS for them so that literally every project was isolated from every other project. Every one of them had their own dedicated cube. All of our communications were in a separate one. Basically, I had a system that was so security hardened that uh, um, it was it was a good model. Of course, most of the people didn't want to do that. But, you know, maybe I was just being like, hey, if you want security, you got to do it right. Um, of course, I got them to use UB keys as well instead of like phone numbers and things like that. Uh, but Cubes was a big part of that. Uh, because we had a bigger target, we making sure that using Cubes 
everything in your disk is encrypted. And then if you get into there, then you have to get into each of the individual cubes. And then those are all isolated apart from each other. So those are some of the use cases. The philosophy, of course, is to have a system which is uh, very as safe and secure as we can make a system. It's obviously not perfect. Um, and where cubes runs into a few issues is it is a little bit more difficult to use. So if you are just switching to Linux, particularly if you're just switching to Linux because you want some more privacy than Windows or Mac can get you, there are a number of other Linux distributions that are equally good uh, for your basics, for getting started, which are not going to be as complicated as cubes. Cubes can be complicated. So if you're brand new to Linux, you might not want to use Cubes OS right away, but what you will probably want to do is use like a Fedora, use like a Debian. These follow this, this um, those two follow this pure uh, FOSS philosophy. Um, there is, check out the Free Software Foundation. They have a series of other distros that are exclusively FOSS. You can have a look at some of those ones as well. Um, but with cubes, this is something if you're already a little bit more comfortable with Linux, you understand the difference between, you know, some of these things, elements are Fedora, some of these things are, are uh, Debian. You will might have to configure cards in different ways and stuff like that. Again, that's what I used to have to do. So we'll see what it looks like when we get into uh, into four. Um, but when you get into four, uh, 4.1.0, I thought 4.1.1 was out. Maybe that just dropped. I don't know. Uh, but 4.1.0, you can download from the website. And uh, when you click on this guy here, you can grab the uh, distro from them and you can grab your torrent. Now, since this is a uh, this, since this is a Linux distribution specifically designed for privacy, um, and security, make sure you are validating your download, okay? And I've downloaded mine and I have validated my copy. Um, it is, I think, six gigabytes, so plan on needing to have a drive that is formatted either in NTSF or EXT4 or something else that supports higher than a four gigabyte limit. Uh, FAT32, four gigabyte limit for files, file size. If you try and download cubes and move it to a, a FAT32, it's not going to fit. So make sure you have a file system which can support a file as big as a 6.1 gigabyte file. Why is it so big? Well, it's basically Fedora and Debian inside of there with a bunch of other factors that make all of this work. So it is a large download, but it is worth it. Uh, if you are using Cubes, please walk through their survey. I did walk through this survey when I downloaded it most recently. What the survey is going to do is it's going to give them information about what is the use case scenarios, because these guys do really listen to their user base. And uh, they, they will take that information as they make future versions and releases. They're going to take that information and uh, put it in. So uh, I think one of the changes is they dropped, um, you used to be able to use Fedora or Debian for the backbone of it. Right now, I think they dropped that based on user surveys. They're doing just Fedora for the backbone with Debian as uh, VMware uh, templates and things like that. So we'll see what that looks like when we actually get into it. I'm going to click over to the introduction because this will give you a little bit of a layout of the system. Uh, and this is why we're not just jumping right on in. Uh, this is going to be a long enough video with uh, <laughs> just with talking about their basic philosophy. So over here on the uh, far left, we have our, our basic information. We have a Zen hypervisor. Uh, our hard drive comes in. This goes into an administrative VM. So this is actually where all your system administration goes. It's where all your basic system updates and security management goes. This is where you choose uh, what network stacks are going on. So this has two completely separate network stacks. We have a uh, ClearNet network stack. We have a, um, a Tor-based network stack. You can choose which VM connects to which one of those network stacks. All that's managed inside of the uh, admin VM. Uh, we have the um, we have the GUI VM over here. Um, this is where your display manager manager is set, and then this is going to send out everything out to your graphics. Within this, this is going to feed on into uh, application virtual managers. This is where you're going to set up different VMs for different use cases. You might have a main production. You might have uh, one for paying your bills. Uh, I talk. Uh, I have a separate video that I have uh, banking on a separate uh, USB drive. I could very easily 
use cubes for a basic lifelong thing. And one of those cubes is my banking. And one of those cubes is my basic internet browsing. One of those cubes is, you know, looking up that weird mole on the side of your head, whatever else it happens to be. But you can set up separate VMs, which will save data within itself, but will isolate that data from every other VM. And you have a series of template VMs. We have a Fedora, we have a Debian. Uh, there's a Hunix there. Um, there is Windows. I'm doubt that Windows is actually in here. Again, we'll look at it. Um, why My recollection from 3 is you could use Windows, but you had to supply your own copy and whatever else. Now, inside of here, we also have a few other VMs. We have a Vault VM. This can be shared. This is, can be used for like password management, as you can see here as the KeePass XC logo. This can be used for, uh, for using um, any type of password, any type of sharing between things can jump back and forth. So if you need to share a file back and forth between VMs, you can drop it in the vault and share uh, between things. But two individual VMs can't communicate except through this intermediary vault VM. And then the disposable VMs are based on Hunix. Of course, I've talked in the past about Hunix. Hunix is a uh, VM-based way to access Tor components. Uh, it loads two separate VMs. One of those is a network stack. One of those is your main system, which feeds into that network stack. It's a very good way of isolating things. Uh, if you have a beefy enough system that can, you can run multiple VMs, uh, it, it's better to use Hunix than it is to, for example, download the Tor browser bundle because the Tor browser bundle sits on top of your main operating system. Hunix isolates itself from your operating system. So they're using these disposable VMs through Hunix to allow you to spin something up, access Tor, do whatever else you need to do, check out that spammy email that's likely to infect your computer, and then you just kill it at the end and it vanishes. Uh, it all disappears. You can see that um, uh, the the Hunix VM uh, feeds into the system firewalls. Uh, your main apps feed, feed into the system firewalls, all controlled by a Fedora backbone. Your firewalls feed into a network stack. And um, we also have uh, the, the network stack will feed into your basic, however you're accessing your internet. Uh, and it looks like this one here, we might be operating slightly different than the 3X branch. We'll talk about that when we actually get to it, when I get a chance to look into it. Uh, the other factor is the USB stack. So any type of USB uh, plugins you put in here, uh, you'll have the ability to feed into different VMs. You could share it between different VMs. So you have a way of isolating your system in a variety of different components to give you a really good secure system with the privacy elements of being able to isolate different components from each other, which is very good. So that is kind of what it is. Looking at their features page, strong isolation. This is what Cubes is good at. Uh, we have templates. We have multiple operating systems. Uh, you can use a variety of systems at the same time. Basically, like I said, you can throw in an ISO. Who knows? Maybe I'll try and throw a Windows install in there. I Actually, don't know if I have room on the drive I'm going to use. We'll figure it out when we get there. Uh, we can do disposables. We have the uh, Hunix integration for Tor. And I think that they probably are using uh, Hunix for Tor uh, maybe to get us more isolation. I think it used to feed the uh, Tor network through a separate VM, which I don't think was based on Hunix. But this will, this will mask both Hunix and Cubes users under the same basic fingerprint. I think that that's what they're going to do. I'll see if I can look into that. Uh, that's what my guess is looking at this. We can um, uh, isolate separate devices through USB controllers. So uh, if you have, for example, files that can only touch one VM, you can do that. And then, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of other, other options. Now, your big downside to running cubes, here's, I, I like this graphic as well. Let's see if we can make this one a little bit bigger. Uh, this guy here allows you to isolate your different, your different elements. So we have work administration, we have uh, blogging stuff. Basically, it's talking about how you can isolate your life into different components. Is it complicated? Sure. But if you're talking about really moving to the next level of security and privacy, Cubes is the way to go. Uh, but it's just not something you're going to jump right on into. So what are the downsides of using Cubes? Well, the biggest downside is it does take a little bit more uh, beefier of a system. I have been able to run this in the past off of a USB drive on my um, 
work laptop, which is a uh, Intel Core i5 with, I think I have eight gigs of RAM in there. So that's, I have been able to run it off of that. It doesn't run quite as well as off of this. But when I found that laptop at the pawn shop this year, which is a Ryzen 5 laptop, and I have 16 gigs of RAM in there, yeah, I'll be able to run cubes on that quite nicely as a laptop. And the cool thing about that is I'm isolating cubes onto a separate hard drive that's more or less hidden. Uh, you will have to do a little bit of keyboard shenanigans when you first boot up the system to even get to the to the cubes to begin with. Otherwise, it goes into the default Linux Mint build, so I can basically have a, a hidden operating system. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about uh, that when we get into the installation video. Uh, at least that's what my goal is. We'll see if it actually happens. But anyway, this has been an introduction to cubes. Uh, stay tuned for next week. I'm going to try and run these on Mondays until we run out of video topics. So if there are specific things you want me to explicitly look at into cubes, please let me know and I will see if I can work those into it. Um, and hey, if we need to have the tutorial lasting 15 weeks, we can do that. If it needs to last three or four, uh, just to get things running and do basic stuff, we can do that as well. So let me know in the comments down below uh, what types of things you would like to see. And uh, from there, look forward to next week. We should actually get into the installation and uh, hopefully it will work. With that, thanks for watching everybody and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash t-o-m-m or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy... Switching to Linux.